Awesome. Well, welcome to everyone who's entering uh, into our room right now. Um, we are uh, the IRA Fulton Schools of Engineering. Uh, this is a session about our SIDSI School, the School of Computing and Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. Um, we will have our session um, led by faculty um, and advisor, um, and then open for Q&A as well throughout the session. So if you have questions at any point, please feel free uh, to utilize the Q&A tool uh, in Zoom. You will notice that your chat is turned off, um, but you can, uh, you can ask questions um, in the Q&A. Sorry, I just lost my attendee list. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over um, to Dr. Mew and, and Allison, and uh, they can kind of go ahead and get started. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, just to kick off some introductions here, I am uh, Dr. Ryan Muth. I'm a uh, lecturer, senior lecturer for uh, academic and student affairs, but I teach uh, primarily in uh, the SIDSI programs uh, with uh, intro engineering, um, some of the embedded systems courses and the embedded systems capstone, uh, and also some of the intro programming classes and stuff like that. Um, I'll be doing most of the talking uh, to kick off, and uh, but I'd also like to introduce uh, Allison. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Curran. I'm the Assistant Director of Academic Advising for SIDSI. So if you have any advising related questions, I am happy to assist. Awesome. Great. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about today is just a quick overview of some of the majors and what they look like in terms of their structure uh, and what you can end up doing that with them and what the experience at uh, ASU is like in these majors. Uh, the SIDSI major, SIDSI is Computing Informatics Decision Systems Engineering. That's the name of our department and, or our school. And uh, it consists of computer science at the Tempe campus software engineering at Poly and online, computer systems engineering at Tempe, informatics at Tempe, uh, industrial engineering at Tempe, and engineering management at Tempe and online. And we have some concentrations within these degree programs in information assurance and software uh, engineering, and they spread uh, throughout a few of them. And I think we're standing up one uh, in robotics, but uh, that's uh, uh, fully not fully fleshed out yet. Um, What's the difference between some of these? Uh, it's computer science and software engineering sound really similar. So does uh, computer systems engineering. Uh, and, and really they're all very related. At, um, in our department, in our school, they all focus on uh, a, a set of core programming classes. CSC 110 is intro programming. 205 is um, uh, Java with data structures. Uh, 230 is computer architecture. 310 is data structures. Uh, there's a few variants in the software engineering program that are taught out of poly. They have different course numbers, but it's basically the same content. And all three of these majors really build on this core programming experience. From there, it sort of specializes. The computer science is focused on algorithm design and analysis. So it might be things like data processing. There's more of a math focus to it uh, than uh, some of the other uh, disciplines. And it's kind of, I see it as kind of the tool maker, right? The uh, computer scientist is similar to the physicists in the physical science, right? They're looking at uh, basic principles of computing. They're looking at algorithm design. They're developing tools and concepts and um, skills that other sort of engineering applied, uh, um, uh, applied sciences people can use to solve greater problems. So it's kind of like solving meta problems or discovering new things in uh, computer science, right? And that's sort of where the artificial intelligence stuff lies. It's sort of where the um, uh, algorithm design stuff lies. It's, it's how to solve big problems using computers. And that's what the science of, of computer science is. Uh, software engineering is much more of an application focus. So you take the tools that the computer scientists have developed and you figure out how to apply them within an engineering context to solving problems that people have. So what a computer scientist might make is not necessarily something that people are going to interact with directly ever. It might just be processing a whole bunch of data or how you organize a bunch of data in the most efficient way to solve a bunch of problems. Software engineers work on application development. They work on 
um, maybe web, mobile, or enterprise applications, and it's a process focus. So how do you gather requirements? How do you define the structure and design the structure of a uh, software system? Uh, then how do you build those pieces? How do you test it? What are the processes that you need to go through in order to develop applications that are secure, that are robust in the environment? And, and these are kind of like the craftsmen. These are uh, people that are making things that are going to go into um, uh, that can go into uh, the, the hands of people. So the stuff that we interact with, whether it's on our phones, whether it's on the web, whether it's on our desktop or anything like that, those are developed principally by software engineers, whereas the computer scientists are behind. Um, I saw a question in the, in the chat, uh, can all computer scientists be software engineers and vice versa? There's a ton of crossover here. So you'll learn all of these degrees, learn the core of computer science, and you can um, take that in the applied direction and become a software engineer, or a software engineer can focus more on computer science-y type sides if you take more electives that are focused on algorithm development and computer theory and stuff like that. Um, so, so you can, there's a lot of blur between these, especially in the job market. It's uh, sort of generically defined, but if there's something specific you want to go into, like um, if you want to go into machine learning or artificial intelligence or something like that, it's, it's better to go one or the other than to go into applied. Like if you want to do uh, web apps or mobile applications or something like that, that's probably better for software engineering than if you want to go into artificial intelligence. But that doesn't mean you can't do either or both, right? Uh, cybersecurity is definitely in the computer science side of things because it's much more um, low level and there's a lot more sort of theory around it. It's very mathematically based and stuff like that. So that's that's kind of where that one lies uh, the most. And that's why it's our, uh, our effort, that's why our uh, concentration program certificate is in computer science and it's not in software engineering. Computer systems engineering is focused on the hardware side. So this, uh, the computer systems engineer are um, people that do programming for the little devices and systems that run our world, right? And that's why I call them the utility workers because they're the ones that are maintaining the infrastructure. So um, these are people that take the um, that, that work in the bridge between the physical and the digital world. So anytime there's a sensor involved, anytime there is a device that's controlling some piece of hardware or machinery, then a computer systems engineer is there to develop the interface between the digital control system and the physical control system. So uh, most of you probably have uh, a thermostat in your house that controls your heating and air conditioning. Right, that's a perfect example of, of a system that's been designed by a computer systems engineer. They sense the current temperature. It uses some um, uh, software to read user input about what the what the uh, you know the person in the house has set the temperature to, and then it makes a little decision about whether or not to turn the air conditioning uh, on or to turn the heat on or or something like that. And that device, its whole job is to do that forever. Right, so it's not a general purpose computer. It's a special purpose computer. It's an embedded system that um, is is a computing system embedded in a product, and its whole lifespan is to do that one thing. And they're everywhere, right? It's your remote control for your TV. It's your TV itself. It's uh, the drivers for your new video card. It's um, uh, developing the firmware for the, the camera that I'm using to broadcast to you, all that kind of stuff. If, it, if it's electronic and it has a display, it's probably got some little code written in it that's written by a computer systems engineer. Uh, what are the differences in practice at a place like Amazon? The computer scientist would be somebody that is working on the recommendation system. So uh, how do you get the computer to decide based on a user's viewing history, what uh, products to show them, right? That's the, that's the core thing that the computer scientist might be working on, the algorithm that makes a recommendation. And how do you study it? Uh, how effective is it? How do you analyze it? Stuff like that. So there's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of math. There's uh, a lot of testing, um, and maybe not a whole lot of coding. It's it's uh, could be 
like design uh, focused and stuff like that. Um, but there's typically a lot of coding uh, involved in well as well. But at the really high levels, you're designing algorithms from a mathematical perspective. Um, if you're like going for your PhD in computer science or something like that. Um, a software engineer would take that recommendation system and they would wrap it in uh, the web interface. So how do we set it up on a server? And then how do we uh, communicate with it through a web page? And how do I format the web page? Uh, and how do I display, you know, how do I retrieve and display the products that it's recommended? Um, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, that's what the software engineer would do. Uh, the computer systems engineering um, person uh, would kind of work on other products. At Amazon, they might work on designing the Alexa systems and the hardware integration for uh, Alexa. So how do we get that little puck to, um, how do we design the circuit boards that go inside that little puck? And then how do we get it to listen to the microphones and analyze that information? How do we get it to connect to uh, the internet through your home gateway uh, and stuff like that? Somebody has to program uh, all of those pieces. Um, which is great. And the questions are coming in fast. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'll get to some of these a little bit later uh, when we have a few more questions uh, and uh, we'll uh, get that as, as soon as uh, I can. But I wanna get through uh, sort of an overview of these uh, before we uh, continue on. The informatics program at ASU is somewhere in between. It's kind of like computer science focused on the organization, presentation and management of large bodies of information. So it's more than database management. You do learn a bunch of stuff about databases, but it's also sort of the user interface side. Like how do I present information? How do I analyze information and then present that to people to support decision-making? So it's a lot of human computer interaction. It's a lot of the study of organizations and how data influences organizations and stuff like that. Um, and and it's, it's this big infrastructure between them. Awesome, thanks, Kaylee. Um, it shouldn't be looked at as like CS or CS Lite. It really is a lot of programming it, and you explore a huge variety of technologies from game technologies, to web technologies and mobile technologies. The uh, spectrum here is sort of like that analogy with physics is computer engineers are on one side that are real close to sort of the hardware. They're close to the physical world. They bridge the physical and digital world. Computer science and software engineering is somewhere in the middle. And then over here on informatics is stuff that people interact with uh, to a very high degree. So it's much more focused on um, the presentation of information. How do we generate responsive uh, web pages that are data driven and all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, careers as a computer scientist might be things like data scientist or software quality assurance. Uh, software engineering, might, you might hear uh, about developers or project management uh, further, uh, sort of further down your career. Uh, in computer systems engineering, hardware design engineer or embedded designer, system architect is the higher level uh, sort of job title uh, in the future. And uh, in industrial engineering, is uh, sort of a different twist on this. So we've got the, the sort of computing related disciplines. Industrial engineering is here because it's the focus on the process, uh, the engineering process. So where computer systems engineering, computer science, we develop software products, industrial engineers design um, processes that uh, people use to improve the systems that they work with, right? And this might be um, like, how do we reduce the waiting time at Space Mountain and Disneyland, right? The industrial engineers develop these little band systems and being able to say, oh, hey, you know, there's, you know, while you're waiting here for this big thing, maybe you might want to go take a ride over there. And that shortens the wait time in this ride. And it sort of balances things out in the park and people are having more fun regularly, right? So rather than spending all day waiting in one line, it kind of spreads it around and everybody everybody has ends up having more fun and a better experience. Uh, layout design in a facility, depending on um, the process, the manufacturing process you're doing, how do you lay it out so that people aren't running across the shop every day with uh, this stuff that takes time, it's extra overhead and it decreases your throughput, it increases accidents, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, quality engineering, how do you um, measure the effectiveness of your processes and whether or not things are going well and how often do you have to sample it to make sure you catch uh, all the errors. Uh, routing and networks, how do we get things from place to place 
in um, a very efficient way. And this could be, you know, the routes that your FedEx driver takes. It could be um, how you sort materials at uh, a shipping uh, warehouse or uh, things like that. It could be simulation uh, where you have to figure out what is the best way to evacuate a stadium. We can't really test that without actually like getting hundreds of thousands of people all in one place and then telling them to run, right? That's a really hard thing to do. So we build simulations that say, you know, this is how we expect them to behave and we can get a better idea of, of how that works. Um, and a big part of this is also like military logistics. How do you get people and equipment into a particular area? How do you support them while they're there? Um, healthcare, how do we uh, improve the processes and make healthcare more efficient while also improving outcomes for patients. Uh, and they work all over the place, like the defense industry, shipping industry. If you make something, if you manage something, if you work with people, all manufacturing industries employ industrial engineers. Um, it's, a, it's a huge, huge area. Engineering management is kind of a crossover between a engineering degree and a management degree. So this is much more focused on um, uh, leadership of engineering driven enter enterprises. So it's like the project managers, the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, sort of uh, managers and leaders that, that go into these engineering disciplines. But in our program, you get a base knowledge of engineering and then also take classes that are related to project management, scheduling, um, all that sort of stuff so that you can be able to converse across a, a wide variety of engineering disciplines and then help uh, manage how those processes work. Um, yeah, so it covers things like, e the management part covers things like economics, accounting, finance, management, leadership classes, stuff like that, on top of a base engineering that you get to pick from. So it doesn't have to be just from uh, SIDSI, it could be electrical engineering or mechanical or aerospace or chemical and uh, civil, right? You can take some of those engineering classes and those apply to this degree, and then you take leadership classes and um, the management classes that that uh, make you a good uh, management person in that field. And literally everywhere uh, that makes something or has engineers uh, employs engineer uh, uh, engineering management students. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about next, real quick, is some of the. Uh, capstone projects that uh, are available uh, for uh, people to do. And this, is, this one is um, Campus Care. This is a mental health resource that was sponsored by a, um, uh, so this is a little demo of the website. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can hear it. Let me see if I can make sure that works. Share sign. There we go. Hello, and welcome to the project demo for Teen Forget Me Nots. The main goal of our project is to create a non clinical, interactive web page for mental health outreach specifically targeted to the ASU community, which is called the Campus Care page. The website has three different experiences for the different audiences who may visit our page ASU students, family members of ASU students, and ASU faculty. The student experience has all of the mental health resources available on campus, including ASU counseling information and any emergency information. Students see content specifically targeted to their mental health needs, including free wellness events on campus. The family members experience offers the same mental health resources as the students, as well as additional tips for how to help their ASU son double. The faculty experience has content that members of ASU faculty can use to improve their students' well-being and resources for when they may be concerned. So this project was, uh, so this is what uh, some of our computer science capstone students ended up working on. And it was sponsored by the mother of a student who committed suicide uh, on campus. They were suffering uh, a mental health crisis. Um, and um, what the, the mother wanted was an ability to help out other students so that this doesn't happen in the future, um, or at least for them to find resources so that they can there can be some sort of intervention. We have resources on campus for this, but where you can imagine with 100,000 students, um, you know that people can fall through the cracks. And this was one way for the students to, to contribute to that. 
Um, another project. Hello, and welcome to the sorry, not that one. Uh, this one is a uh, a project that we're doing with the um, uh, Center of Excellence on uh, campus for the uh, Homeland Security. So the idea here is to help track the number of people that go in and out of a terminal uh, at um, Sky Harbor International and do that in an automated way so they can figure out the best way to staff uh, TSA when, as, as they're going through these things. So the idea is to, to help measure um, traffic through the terminal uh, and figure out, you know, when can we start uh, staffing? When do we need to staff up? When do we need to staff down uh, for um, uh, each of these things? And that'll decrease wait times at the security check-ins and stuff like that. And they were using uh, the video feeds and uh, machine learning to develop uh, a neural network model that can detect people. Uh, and they were able to do some really accurate stuff. And this is an ongoing project uh, right now. Remember, these are seniors. So these are seniors in computer science. Uh, this is what they do at the end of uh, their semester. Uh, another big project we have is um, at ASU is the um, School of Earth and Space Exploration has a project to send a lander to the Psyche asteroid. Uh, and uh, some of the, we have a lot of capstone projects that are related to supporting that initiative and doing some cool stuff. So some of it might be see, you might see robots and stuff like here, that here uh, that are, are uh, being designed as part of that mission. Now, this may not be hardware that goes on the mission, but it's uh, ways to get engaged and ways to explore and be part of this project. And all of this stuff goes to um, uh, the international and uh, the United States space community. So you can sort of get an in on talking to NASA or Jet Propulsion Laboratories or anything like that, if that's what you're interested in. You can see a lot more of these. I'm going to copy these uh, into the chat. These are some of the Capstone Project teaser videos from the last uh, year. Um, and you can see what uh, some of the Capstone, what, what kind of things you, these students end up doing. And these are literally all of the uh, projects that um, all of SIDSI and uh, electrical engineering and uh, biomedical engineering. These are all the projects that uh, students are doing. So you can kind of get, a, get an idea of uh, what's possible uh, in these degree programs. All right, um, let's hit some questions. What are some niche, uh, niche or future technologies that are currently provided as electives or course material? Um, Allison, do you have a good idea of those? The question was what? Sorry. Like what are some uh, special topics classes that are being oh, special offered? Topics. Gonna... Okay, sorry, I misheard you. Um, special topics classes, right now we don't have a lot of them. I mean, they don't stay special topics for very long um, because we are often applying for permanent course numbers because the discipline is so fast moving. Um, some of the more recent permanent numbers um, are in machine learning, uh, data visualization, um, natural language processing, I believe, and um, there was a third one. They're in the data analytics area. I'm blanking on the third title, but we're regularly adding new offerings to the schedule. And when we do have a new topic um, that we're testing out, and that's generally how they start as a, as a 494 special topic. Um, we'll include the syllabus, we'll send a course announcement out, we'll give like a suggested background on it. And if it's popular and it does well with the students, then we'll consider adding it as a permanent ro rotation in our curriculum. Awesome. Yeah. And, and they're all, uh, so we have, we have besides the uh, sort of core classes, we have the artificial intelligence classes like that yep. uh, Allison mentioned. We also have game programming classes. We have mobile web development classes. Mm -hmm. um, these are, there's a lot of things and those are part of the class, the typical catalog of electives. So those are offered regularly. And because we're so big, we can offer a lot of variety of uh, things that fit into the degree program. Yes. Yeah, so those aren't like formal concentrations, as Ryan mentioned, our only formal ones are cybersecurity and software engineering, but certainly there's enough other electives where you could kind of informally create your own concentration, depending on your interest area, or a student could not concentrate intentionally and take courses in a lot of different areas to really get a lot of exposure into different areas of computer science or 
so that's actually kind of freely open for a lot of the programs that's in SIDSI. Mm -hmm. Uh, next one is what course path, what course path would use Python a decent amount? So unfortunately, Python is not one, not yet one of our um, uh, core languages in the curriculum. Uh, we start off with Java and depending on which uh, degree program you go in, you'll also learn um, uh, C and C++. Uh, and then um, it, but Python uh, as a, I can make this go away so we can be big. Uh, Again, uh, things that, that involve Python um, would be in the, probably in the software engineering program the most. Uh, computer science will likely stick with C and C++ or Java uh, because you're looking for performance in most of those. Um, so so uh, right now, very little Python. I think there's some Python, Ryan, if I'm not mistaken, in informatics as well. Oh yeah, that's Does a good one, yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not a focus of any of our courses though, to be clear. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship and CS blend. Absolutely. We, uh, the Fulton schools of engineering as a whole supply or uh, runs a entrepreneurship and innovation program where you can take classes like uh, FSC 301, which is introduction to entrepreneurship and um, uh, the uh, EPICS classes, which are engineering projects and community service. And these are ways to find and solve problems uh, in your communities and in the world and talk about how, and, and they teach you how to um, do the sort of business side along with the, um, the engineering side. So the engineering, any engineering that you invest, that you might go into uh, at ASU can be paired with sort of that entrepreneurship program. And I think those count as general electives. Yeah. Um, FSC 301 is actually a tech elective for all of our programs. Awesome, that's awesome. Um, is going into computer science with a concentration in software engineering, the best path for going into machine learning and artificial intelligence? I would say it's not. Um, there. Those, for one, those courses aren't even included in that concentration. So that's for sure uh, why I'm saying it wouldn't. So essentially concentration takes all of your 400 level electives and spells them out for you. And in that particular concentration, those don't include any of those courses. So I don't think that would make sense. And certainly you could still do that concentration and then intentionally take an artificial intelligence or um, what was the other one? Uh, machine learning course as your two tech electives I mean, that's a way to pair it, but if you if you really wanted to go deep, deep dive into machine learning and AI, um, probably that concentration is, isn't the right way to go. Probably you want to keep no concentration and then just, you know, be able to have that flexibility in your course choices, especially since more new things could come, up, come down the line. I mean, um, it's possible we can have more concentrations as Ryan alluded. I mean, you guys will all be new students. And so a year from now, we can have more stuff, you know, on, on the table here, but as of right now today, I would say don't concentrate. And generally actually for everybody on the call, you're coming in just as a plain major student. You really don't need to declare any kind of concentration right from the get-go. I would actually recommend that everyone starts just plain CS, plain CSE. Um, and then for engineering management, like you actually don't declare a focus as part of like your search um, when, you're, when you're actually declaring your minor that's determined much later down the line after you've had some exposure and experience in courses, it makes much more sense to make those calls in your junior year after you really kind of know what you want to do. Awesome. And that, that relates directly to the next question. When would one choose a specific concentration? Um, what, sophomore year, junior year? You, I would say more, you could probably have a better sense of it sophomore year, but you're really not even going to start taking um, those courses that I think have better exposure into the different areas until your junior year. So for example, junior year, you're going to take software engineering. If you, everyone has to take that. So if you like that course as a CS or CS, well, CS student, because that's the concentration for CS, um, then yeah, maybe a software engineering concentration makes sense. If you don't like the course conversely, then that would maybe indicate that that's not the concentration for you, but you still need to take that course either way. Awesome. Uh, are there any VR electives, uh, based electives? Um, so I think the game program might have some maybe. related to this. Yeah. Uh, maybe the more upper division advanced, um, but honestly, our 
and it's not a focus, I don't believe. Um, the, the ones that are regularly offered are more in the game design component, um, but I, I'm sure that that's included somewhere along the way. I just don't know that it's a full on. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, uh, I know that the higher level courses use, um, uh, they learn Unity and, and that environment and how to build in, in sort of there. And that's the basis for a lot of VR experiences. So it's a it's a stepping stone to being able to develop that sort of stuff, but I don't think we use like VR hardware in many of the classes, if any of them at this point. Is there support for internships for in undergrads? Yeah, um, we have our a whole engineering career center um, that's dedicated to just our students. They have dedicated career fairs every semester and in this last year you know they've been virtual and that's actually been kind of nice in a way because they've been able to kind of cohort the days based off of um interests you know the employer like computing for example was a whole day um that they had so that would you know obviously just kind of narrow it down for our group as opposed to back in the old days when it was just the whole you know floor of the mu and we they try to like wrangle all of our employers into a certain area, I think it gave more opportunities to students. Internship can be counted as part of the degree requirements for all of our programs um, as a tech elective or 400 level elective, depending on where it may be needed. But with that said, certain requirements are needed to even be eligible for it because it is academic and you are earning credit. So you generally would be a junior in that case if you were trying to take the course for credit towards your degree. Now, again, that doesn't mean a freshman can't have an internship, it just means you wouldn't get credit for it. We still obviously encourage work at any level um, because it's certainly good experience. And then there's some experiences you could have on campus just in research as well that may be paid or unpaid um, that you can participate in along the way. Awesome. Uh, are AI or ML offered as elective subjects? Are they part um, of the syllabus. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think there's any core require, there's any, any of the, pro none of the programs require um, AI or machine learning courses. Um, so uh, the, all of those are, are electives. But they're regularly offered. Yeah. Uh, how difficult is it to register for popular courses to a large number of students? Depends. Um, you know, we work really, really hard on our uh, cap forecasting. Um, so we, there's a lot that goes into that. And as you can imagine, I mean, our school has 8,700 students roughly. So it's an enormous puzzle to figure out, not to mention other programs that like to take our courses. Um, so with that said, we really do try to um, plan it in such a way that you know, you you're supposed to start taking your electives kind of in the latter part of your junior year. And when, when students who are, you know, lower than that are trying to register, they're, they're not gonna get that priority. And that's kind of intentional the way the schedule is built. Um, so in the way that students are set to register as well. So for example, um, you know, obviously seniors are gonna register before, you know, freshmen, you know, cause they gotta make sure they get what they need to graduate. So seniors are always gonna have priority on you know required courses you know because we have to make sure that they graduate but we cohort you so everywhere along the way you're part of a priority group at some point and so if there's a scenario where you know you're dying to get into a class and you weren't able to if it's offered in a future semester we're going to say hey you didn't need it this semester but it's going to be offered in this future semester you'll have priority then or if, if it really is your last semester and you have not had a chance to take a course we'd be more than happy to work with you to get like on some kind of wait list. You know, and that's something that we typically do. Awesome. What's the graduation rate of CSE in percent? In the same program? Um, let me go to the next one, I'll look it up. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, Startup research and funding opportunities provided by ASU. Are there CS software engineering based startups that have been founded from ASU? There are, there's a ton of them. Um, that same entrepreneurship and innovation center, uh, the classes also bleed into a set of services that um, can help uh, do that. So we have Changemaker Central, 
We have the entre entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, we have venture devils. We have a bunch of programs that are designed to help students uh, that are interested in this uh, stand up so uh, engineering endeavors. I do not have a, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember any, um, but I know there are a bunch. And if you look up the uh, venture devils or you look up uh, the entrepreneurship and, uh, and innovation uh, center uh, at Fulton Schools of Engineering, you'll see um, uh, a list of things that have succeeded and stories about, about how they've uh, uh, kicked off. Um, for research and funding, um, there's a bunch of prizes. There's th uh, student organizations that can uh, support that thing. There's also um, the Fulton Undergraduate Research Initiative, which gives you a stipend and you can work with a faculty member to do uh, undergraduate research. Uh, which is a great story on your resume, and it's also something you can turn into an entrepreneurship uh, program as well. Okay, so in looking at so students, so students, for example, that entered computer science in 2015, so they should have been graduated by 2019 or so if they're on a four-year path. Um, we had about 409 students enter that year. And so far, uh, 144 of them have graduated thus far um, in the same program. So, so again, that's within the same program. So that doesn't mean they've not graduated elsewhere because um, it, it is common that some students you know, start off, I want computer science, I want computer science, or I want you know, computer systems, and then they get into it and it's not what they thought it was, or they want business or something totally different. So, so that's again, within the same school. Awesome. Uh, the, somebody asked about what is at ASU for cybersecurity, it, that we label it kind of oddly, where, um, sorry, uh, there we go, all attendees. Uh, we label it kind of oddly, so we call it information assurance, and I just linked to the information assurance center. And there's also this page on um, uh, concentrations, so you'll find this in the uh, the chat. Uh, you guys should be able to see that, uh, even if you're not able to uh, post a question there. Uh, but it gives information about the different uh, emphasis areas, what they look like in detail, uh, and some more information. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Would you recommend students pursue the Grand Challenges Scholar Program curriculum? Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's a good benefit. It's, it's a good add-on. You can certainly incorporate a lot of it within the program if you, if you kind of plan early and plan right. For example, the entrepreneurship course that Ryan mentioned, that's part of it. Um, you could do epics as part of the program. And then if you're building up into that, and, and epics is engineering projects and community service. Um, some high schools have it, if that sounds familiar. Um, so that could be something that built, it's built within. You could do a study abroad experience built within that. So I think it's a good add-on. I mean, it doesn't hurt to start with it. And then if, if it turns out like it wasn't what you thought it was, or, you know, it's not that something that you want to finish, you could always, you're not like locked into it, from what I understand. And then when you graduate from it, which is really cool, um, you get added to this like national registry of Grand Challenge Scholars. I mean, and I guess you know, your employers could look that up and, you know, it's recognized. So that's kind yeah. of neat. It's a, it's a great way at college to develop sort of the stories that will lead to your future career, right? You're engaging with a wide variety of different types of problems and people learning a, a, a broad skill set. And um, uh, the, the both EPICS community, or the grant, both EPICS, the GCSP, Grand Challenge Scholars Program, um, and, and some of the other programs we've already talked about are um, ways to sort of differentiate yourself in, the, in your career. And, and it makes it, you know, you could, if you go into an interview and say, you know, what makes you special, you can talk about what you did for Epics, you can talk about what you did for Grand Challenge Scholars Program, or you can talk about what you did for, um, uh, you know, Venture Devils or something like that, and what those experiences taught you. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that differentiates you from the other students that have a bachelor's degree from all the other schools and, and stuff like that. Related to that, what tech companies usually come to the career fair for CS recruitment? Oh, that is a long list. 
I, um, Ryan, I dropped a link in the chat for you. Um, oh. The employers on campus for FSC is the full list of all companies that engaged with Fulton from 2018 to 2020 for our career fairs and info sessions, and it's alphabetized. Um, and then um, there's an FSC graduate outcomes link I also provided that has a list of the top employers from student reported um, data that were hired. So you can kind of skim that. Um, for That's awesome. Who are interested. That's fabulous. What kind of references are generally required for CS based internships? Um, that's going to be really challenging to answer because the companies outside of ASU are the ones doing the internship um, recruiting. Um, I know that I have students asking for references from me and other faculty uh, pretty regularly. So, so getting to know your professors, uh, getting to know the, the people, if you have an on-campus job, that's a good place to uh, get a reference. Um, those sort of things help uh, a lot. Um, beginning of the slides, the different concentrations were split across different campuses. Are you able to take classes at both Poly and Tempe? I don't yeah. think so. Well, you, you, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, it does present a bit of a logistical challenge though. Um, I mean, there's an inner campus shuttle. You certainly have to make sure that you're padding enough time in between the classes to make sure that you can get from A to B. Um, but yes, it, it, it's definitely possible. Um, what's really nice is we do have software engineering available at the Polytechnic campus. And um, actually all of our SIDSD programs more or less have the same first two semesters almost identical, or at least it's transferable from one to the other. So we offer CSE 110, 205, for example, at that campus, Calc at that campus. So if for some reason you live closer to Polytechnic campus, but you want computer science, I'd recommend you consider starting in software engineering. And then if down the line um, you change, I mean, no harm, no foul, it's the same requirements. That's why we've built our program that way. Awesome. Uh, what are common minors students pair with the CS major? Um, it really ranges the gamut and math popular because it, it appears to be easy to complete, but it's still an extra three courses. And I think it also, happens to look kind of easy to complete as an employer um, looking at it. Uh, I think the most meaningful minors are ones that you're really going to get an extra added benefit out of. So um, often we'll see like a foreign language minor because that's obviously something that's pretty different. Um, we'll see, um, I'm blanking right now, uh, statistics is a little bit more different and not as so incorporated as what we're doing in the major. Um, we'll see, um, digital culture as a certificate, we'll see gaming as a certificate, that's popular. Informatics is now becoming more popular as a certificate. And if you're wondering, a certificate and minor are virtually the same. It's just the double counting rules are a little bit different. Um, business is popular, but we also have engineering management as a minor, um, that's another popular one. So I would say really anything could be paired. I mean, and for that matter, we see double majors um, ranging from CS and German to uh, you know, CS in electrical engineering or CS in industrial engineering. So like anything's possible, but just know that whenever you're adding something like that, it's potentially adding time as well. Allison, there's another question in here that I'm going to jump down to that ties to what um, you were just chatting about. Um, they're just asking if they're majoring in electrical engineering, is it recommended or more common to also double major in computer science, software engineering, or CSE, uh, computer systems engineering? So it sounds like that particular individual has kind of their foot in both both areas of interest. Um, I would say computer systems engineering is a kind of a nice hybrid option of both uh, computer science and computer computer science and electrical engineering. If they had a kid, it's kind of computer systems engineering, if you will. Um, and so that may be the better option to go with. But not that said, again, you could double. But I think the question is, what are you trying to get out of it? So. In that scenario, I would say maybe CSE is the one that you want to look at because it does have the CS component and the EE classes involved with it. And then rather than doing a double major, instead maybe consider a four plus one opportunity. And then you could do a master's degree um, in maybe computer engineering with the electrical engineering focus, for example. So there's a lot of different routes you can go, but um, it sounds like you may want to look pretty closely at the computer systems engineering program. Yep. 
Ryan, would you agree with that? Absolutely. I think that's a great characterization. Uh, and uh, the four plus run program with electrical engineering in the computer engineering program is a really cool uh, recommendation. I think that's a, a, a really unique position for, for uh, our schools to offer. Um, are we able to get internships during our freshman year or do we have to wait until the juniors or seniors? I think Allison, you mentioned that it doesn't count as course credit during the freshman year, but you certainly can get an internship. Exactly. So okay. I guess, I mean, anyone can, you can have an internship before you go to college even. Um, so it really just depends on the individual, um, but depending on the internship that you're looking for, some of them are gonna be requiring that like higher level programming knowledge if it's a really, really technical internship. So you may not be eligible for that depending on you know what you're looking at, but there are certainly intern internships and job opportunities that are just looking for, hey, can you help us with X, Y, Z? And, and any experience is good experience. So it would definitely be encouraged. Absolutely. I know a lot of, uh, a lot of my students that come out of F, uh, intro engineering during their following summer, they'll get jobs. They may not count as um, course credit, but they are doing something that's at least peripherally related to their field. When I was a freshman, I got a job basically sorting PDF files for a, a company uh, that was doing engineering. And I learned a lot there, but it wasn't the most engineering focused job. Right, um, so so that's might what you might be what you end up finding uh, in um, uh, availability after your freshman year. But the higher you go in the degree program, the more specialized your skills get, and the more in demand they get. Uh, what depth of knowledge would I get in a general sense from electives? So the purpose of electives is to take the uh, degree core and specialize into that area, and it's pretty high level. Um, uh, content. So these are uh, the electives are good classes to take if you want to specialize in a particular field or study or work in a particular field. They provide you the introduction and then the um, uh, extension uh, and somewhat de deep knowledge on uh, a particular topic. So you, if you take the intro to AI class, you get basics of artificial intelligence, and then you can take machine learning and you can take uh, data science and uh, stuff like that, and really extend that. Um, uh, it's in a in a fifteen week class. We can't teach you everything in a single one to make you like an industry expert. That takes experience, uh, but it's enough to be able to say, "Here's a project that I work on. This is what I learned," and and that can open that door to uh, a career in that field. And that's related to this next question too. Uh, would a mobile development web app elective equip me enough to get an internship or a job, even though I'm a core CS major? Um, yeah, it really depends on, um, you know, there's no guarantees, right? So you can't take a class and then be guaranteed a job in this thing. It's about being able to uh, show and tell a story to the, uh, the people that are hiring you about, you know, what makes you special and what makes you the best fit for that job. Um, so if you've got really great um, grades in CS, and you've got a couple of mobile web development classes, you're going to be really competitive with software engineers uh, in that area. But the software engineers are going to get more classes, are going to have more required classes that focus on the process of engineering and the practice of uh, the process and practice of software development than the core CS people are. But there's a lot of blur in between them. So you can take more software engineering electives as a computer scientist and kind of fill those gaps. So there's a lot of, a lot of crossover between them. Can you study, uh, where did I find this? I saw this somewhere, hold on. I'm trying to find a link to the game development program. What, the certificate? Yeah. Uh, I can I can put it in. Awesome. Yeah, so there you can absolutely study game design and development as part of any of the degree programs. So it's uh, not specific to computer science. You can, I believe, add it on as a certificate. It's going to be easiest for the programming core, so software engineering, computer science, and uh, computer systems engineering because you have that that base core knowledge um, and uh, that's where you can uh, sort of build on from there. 
Sorry, the link I just put wasn't the one I wanted. Sorry. <laughs> Let me put the new one. This is the link that has all the SIDSI programs. Awesome. And here's the uh, gaming certificate main page. If you want to get more detail there. Uh, what are the requirements for the capstone project? Um, that is a very broad question. So what we do in our programs is we find projects from industry um, that uh, students can work on. So we go out and, and find these projects. We present a big catalog for you to pick from. Um, we try to match you with the best uh, project uh, based on your preferences. And then you can you can work on that project for uh, two whole semesters as uh, the, the capstone sequence. Um, you can propose your own project, uh, which just has to be something that is a good project for teams. You have to find a sponsor, um, either a faculty member or um, somebody that works in industry to help guide you and serve as sort of uh, an evaluation point. Um, and but other than that, it's a it's a pretty broad definition. It just has to have the right scope. Um, if you're in uh, CSE or uh, in CS, you'll probably hear from me, um, you know, in four years if you decide to go down that uh, path uh, to with that, because I, I help manage that program as well. Uh, if I chose my major to be computer science, and if I would like to change my major to CSE, when is the best time to do that? I probably, if you're considering that possibility, I would start with CSE, and then you could potentially change to CS. The reason I say that is CSE is more um, structured in their requirements for lab sciences, for example. Um, so you would have to take physics and chem or bio with CSE, and that's not required for CS. And so if you went too far down the CS path and took like geology, then you'd have to take an extra science. So I'd recommend you start with CSC and then if, if necessary, change to CS. And I would say you would change before your junior year. Mm -hmm. As an incoming freshman, do you recommend, what do you recommend for the summer? Are there recommended summer courses or internships that uh, we can apply for? So again, jobs are out there. So I would um, apply for jobs, any, any and all experience is good. Um, summer courses, I would say, you know, if, if you know that you're not calc ready, um, then that's something that you should be working on. Uh, English is an easy requirement to get out of the way if you're bored in the summer and want to knock stuff out. Um, but that, those are really the two areas. I mean, if you're wanting to take a programming class in the summer, CC 110 is available. Um, but I would say really only if you're if you're behind in an area, focus on catching up in that area. That that would be the first priority. And then if you're wanting to get ahead in an area, yeah, programming would be a good place to start. We have a ton of summer courses actually, um, so th so that would be the place to start with that. Awesome. Having a two year break between high school and college, where the time was used for internship and startups, would this generally be a positive or a negative in terms of the story? um in the competitive job and internship market i think it all depends on how you market yourself i think you would turn that into a positive um, and our career center can help you to um, strategically come up with ways to discuss that particular um, gap between high school and college but honestly i don't know that that's a gap that's very obviously looked at by an employer it's usually like if there's a huge gap in employment history that's looked at um, and maybe that's where that would come up. Like if you had these internships and then you stopped working for four years to go to college, like that might be something that you need to be prepared to discuss. But, um, you know, assuming that you still want to maybe try for internships in the summer, that wouldn't even be something that I think would raise a red flag necessarily. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I think it's actually a strength. You're, uh, you've got a, a variety of experiences. You're doing other things. Um, the gap between high school and college is not something that is, uh, typically looked at as a negative, especially if you can have something you can talk about that you learned from it, that, like I said, that story is what engages, um, you know, having a set of those stories and those stories that differentiate you from other students and other graduates mm -hmm. with the same degree program, that is, uh, that's what gets you jobs, right? Mm -hmm. And and gets you, gets you at the top of that resume pile. 
Um, and the Career Center has a ton of programs for helping with that. Like uh, we do, they have uh, resume writing uh, mm -hmm. workshops. They have uh, technical interview workshops. Um, they've Talk got interviews, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, they've got all I, kinds of stuff. I would also say like two years, I mean, that's kind of maybe specific to that individual, but I think it's pretty common right now because of COVID that people took a gap year this year. Um, so I think it's going to be a pretty common story and certainly not one to worry too much about, but maybe just plan to, to, to be able to address it. Yeah. And we have, we have uh, students all the time that come in as a uh, second career. I've got a bunch of uh, yeah. veterans that come in. I've got uh, people that are switching careers that have been working in um, like manufacturing or something like that. And now they're studying computer systems engineering. Um, we, it takes all kinds and, and we have lots and lots of systems to support um, everybody and, and really help, help you succeed. That also said, I mean, that's really the, the reoccurring theme with our online student population. And that said, we, we do have a lot of online programs available, engineering management, software engineering, but you know, if for some reason, you know, there, there are issues and you're not able to attend in person because we are going to be back to in person in the fall, consider looking at some of the online programs as well. I mean, there could be some scholarship implications, but it's a way to maybe get started if you're not able to kind of jump in full time because of everything going on in the world or whatever the case may be. So we can work with you on some of that as well. Yeah. All right. I think that's uh, probably all the time we have today. Uh, thank you guys for excellent questions. This was really great. Um, and I hope we uh, were able to uh, help you sort of clarify what we do here and, and what uh, kind of services and stuff we have available. Yes, if you have any questions following the session, I'm going to drop my email address in um, the chat for you. You can always connect uh, to us through my email or regular Fulton Schools at ASU.edu. Allison dropped hers in as well. Um, students for next steps, if we're admitted students, um, if you attended, some of you, I recognize your name from attending the session Mike and I had yesterday about student next steps. Um, those sessions, the session today, those should be posted on our webinar page by the end of next week. Um, but you can also check your My ASU, submit your enrollment deposit and get started on the new student experience, um, which includes registering for a college planning session um, as well as uh, housing. Um, so again, any questions, you can always reach out. I, awesome. I just want to also add just having from the student experience and having answered a lot of these questions, the My ASU page makes it look like you should be meeting with an advisor like before you register for the new student experience. And that's not the order of events. So really you need to pay your enrollment deposit, register for the new student experience, an advisor will be um, at those events. That's where you'll get registered. And, and mass placement needs to be like near the next step at the top, like like before in order for us to get you registered in the right schedule. So I know it says whatever it says in my issue. I'm telling you, do it the way I'm saying it. It is going to make your life a lot easier. And mm -hmm. ours. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, you can always reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, but with that, a big thank you to Allison and Ryan. Um, we hope everyone has a great weekend and go Devils. Bye. Thanks all.